Good evening. Welcome to our seminar host by the San Mateo County Dental Society. As I look out there, I, I know we've uh, got a good audience tonight. That's really, really exciting. Uh, my name is Brad Hart and I'm the 2021 president of our great San Mateo County Dental Society. Uh, before we all get started tonight, I want to review how we'll be running this meeting. All of our uh, participants will be placed on mute. Our presenter will provide a presentation on treating dental trauma. And during this presentation, you may post questions to the question and answer box. For those uh, participants on a desktop, the Q&A box is located on the bottom of your screen. And for those on an iPad or iPhone like myself, the Q&A box should be on the upper right. Please uh, just feel free to post your questions. And unlike normal times, uh, Dr. Tittle has agreed that he will try to answer the questions as they come up and I'll try to be alerted uh, to be able to ask him during the presentation. So hopefully we'll get him as, as he is talking and get the question answered at that time. So tonight's speaker is Dr. Ken Tittle. He came highly recommended by a good friend of mine and mentor and instructor at University of Pacific and people that went there would know Bruce Fogel. He uh, headed up a study group that invited me somewhere about 20 years plus ago. Uh, Dr. Tittle is a third generation dentist. He means a full-time practice in endodontics in Pleasant Hill and in Walnut Creek. He is an assist associate professor of endodontics at the Arthur Dagoni University of the Pacific School of Dentistry and has lectured to local dental societies, the CDA, the ADA, and the American Association of Endodontics on various subjects and aspects of endodontics. Uh, his area of interest are traumatic injuries, resorption, and advanced technology to diagnose and treat endodontically involved teeth. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics a fellow of the American College of Dentists, a past board member of the Public and Professional Relations Committee of the AAE, and past president of the California State Association of Endodontics. His favorite avocations all involve water. So as long as it's frozen water, I'm right there with you. So I'll give it over to Dr. Tittle. All right. So is everyone seeing what we got? Is that all working? Can someone let me know for sure before I start heading now? Yes, anyone? you're working. All right. Um, so uh, I've been speaking about trauma. I was just talking with uh, Alan Gleskin at UOP because I'm actually uh, lecturing the second year students um, Monday morning on trauma and resorption. And I'm pretty sure it's the 25th year um, that I've been doing that. And it will be significant um, because my middle daughter is actually going to be in the class on Monday morning at seven. And I think it was four years ago, three years ago, my oldest daughter was in the class at UOP Dental School when I lectured on trauma. And in, this is really crazy, in a year and a half, my youngest son will be in the dental school class listening to me lecture on trauma. So those uh, are all fourth generation dentists. And, uh, you know, I, uh, it's amazing it's worked out that way. And sometimes I think, you know, my family doesn't have much imagination, but um, I, I have to feel good about that um, because if, if dad didn't like what he did, they wouldn't be choosing that. And I do like what I do. And it is these types of situations like trauma uh, where there maybe really isn't a book on how to do it. And we were supposed to be relying on best practices and <clears throat> our own creativity and just kind of overall idea of what it means to be a healer. And in trauma, it really tests us that way because um, most of the things I'm gonna be showing you are happening to uh, children that are still developing. 
and trauma lends us to some things in dentistry that we don't get access to very often in terms of healing that can happen and harnessing tissues that are still developing. And I think it really is, is, a, is a subject that tests us and um, it is something where there's not a whole lot of evidence-based things to go on. Um, so these are my two favorite central incisors, my own. And I dove into the bottom of the pool when I was about 10 and fractured the mesial incisal on tooth number eight. And then when I was about 14, I was knocking the handle off of a pickaxe to get it, uh, just the metal part off and the wooden handle jumped up and hit me in the face. And it knocked the pin retained silicate uh, mesial incisal out of tooth number eight and cleaved tooth number nine to the lingual and there was actually a pulp exposure. Uh, I came down off the hill and went straight to my dad's office and there was a direct pulp cap placed on tooth number nine. These are, I think, my third or fourth set of crowns on them. And this is successful management of trauma. Uh, you notice no root canal treatment. And it's always kind of interesting to me that trauma in dental schools usually gets taught through the endodontic department. And really, that's kind of the least significant part of managing trauma. It's, you know, what happens with the attachment apparatus? How do we restore it? How do we make them aesthetic? And we really hope to not ever have to do a root canal on the teeth. And with kids' teeth, we can get away with that a lot easier. So this is 47-year recall on them now. I should probably change that to 48. I turned 58 this week. Gosh, that seems, you know, that's another topic. Um, so this is uh, kind of the Bible on trauma by Jens Andresen, and there is now a fifth edition out. Um, and I think it's uh, over 300 pages just about traumatic injuries to teeth. Um, so this is an immense uh, topic, and it's always challenging for me to try to limit it uh, to two hours when I'm talking about it. Uh, but it's kind of the nice thing about Zoom is you guys can take a little break if you want. Um, and uh, you know, I will stay at this as, as long as you want me to. Uh, but we're planning on being done uh, about 8.30. So when you look at the cover of this book, uh, it can actually look like a kind of depressing story. Uh, initially, there's some sort of injury and the tooth is luxated. It is repositioned surgically. After a little while, there's resorption. And then after a little while longer, there's a root canal. And then after a little while longer still, there's an implant. And we don't need to hang our head in shame if that's the way things wind up with this. Uh, because in someone who is growing, it is really important to keep their teeth there as long as we can. So um, I love this quote uh, where um, it was attributed to Mark Twain. And, and it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And I think that this is something to remember in dentistry in general and especially in trauma is things change. And one of the hardest things to do is to unlearn something. You spend a lot of time learning and maybe you spend a lot of money learning. I mean, as dentists, if you're getting out of dental school anytime recently, you're spending more on your knowledge than most of the country spends on a house ever. Um, so this is kind of a neat thing because this was actually the very first uh, uh, frame in the movie, The Big Short. And The Big Short was all about people not checking into things, right? The, the mortgage issues. Um, but turns out Mark Twain, no one, no one can find that he ever said this, but they attribute it to that in the movie. And the whole idea is people aren't doing their own research. And maybe that's one thing that you know, 2020 has taught us that we need to look into things uh, on our own. And the real quote uh, that uh, the book, The Big Short starts with is this one, the most difficult subjects can be explained to the most slow-witted man if he has not formed an idea of them already, but the simplest thing cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he firmly is persuaded that he knows already without a shadow of doubt what's laid before him. And this is a hard thing when we've learned something and now we wanna to try to learn something new and it, it conflicts with what we already have. So um, I was a biopsychology major at UCSB, and it was always really exciting to make these rats lever press for food and you know shape their behavior. And uh, you know it would be great when they would get over there and we could start to make them do what we needed them to do. And it turned out that young rats uh, learned that pretty quickly, and it took longer for old rats to learn to lever press. And then when you would take the food away, the young rats would stop lever pressing quicker, but the old rats would keep it up. And the initial theory was, well, you know, it takes old rats longer to learn. 
uh, but they've got a better memory. Um, and then probably some young grad student said, well, isn't that just new behavior that the old rat is still not learning? That lever pressing for the food is no longer giving a reward, but they keep at it. Um, and it turns out, you know, that's really pretty more, much more what we think is going on. So it is important when the game changes that we need to change our behavior. Um, studies in dentistry these days are kind of evolving. Um, there are a few different ways to look at problems. One would be process centered. Um, and that might be in medicine, something like where they measure how long it takes uh, for a patient to get to the emergency room. You know, they think it is related um, to outcomes, but it, you know, it's not really sure. And this would be, you know, like a dye leakage study um, in endodontics where we're seeing if a sealer's leak to dye, we think it's related uh, to the result, but we really can't say that for sure. Getting a little closer might be disease centered in medicine. This might be someone with hypertension they give them medication and they take their blood pressure, their hypertension goes down, they're all happy, but the patient doesn't really, you know, have a noticeable benefit. In endo, you know, that might be, you know, they've got this asymptomatic radiolucency that everyone's all worked up about. We do a root canal, we take another radiograph in a year, the radiolucency is gone and we're all happy, but the patient doesn't really know a difference. What we want to get to is more patient-centered outcome studies. You know, in medicine, this might be, you know, gee, I love this new medication. I can go for a walk with my grandson now without getting out of breath. And, you know, in dentistry, this might be, oh, you know, I'm so glad I had that root canal done. You know, I can drink cold water. It doesn't hurt anymore. Or, you know, I'm so glad I had that banged up root canal treated tooth extracted and I love my implant. And um, these are things that make a difference to patients. And there's a time element to it that we need to be aware of also that the endo's not really paid enough attention to, in my opinion. So um, this uh, tooth number 30 and 31 uh, is a 55 year recall on this root canal and this buildup on tooth number 30. And this is a retired hygienist. And when she was 25, everyone said, you need to have this tooth extracted. And she said, no, you don't. I want you to do everything you can to save it. Um, and I think we'd agree this, this would probably be negligent if someone did that right now yet you cannot argue with the patient-centered result here where she still has her tooth. Yes, there is this change on the radiograph around the end of the root and the root filling is not what I would be proud of these days, but I sure don't have very many 55 year recalls of my successful treatment. And so this is the kind of thing that we need to get our mind around a little bit more and maybe be a little listening to patients a little bit more and not necessarily hung up on this whole predictability thing that we believe is related to the studies we have. Um, so I actually did uh, retreat tooth number 31 because they were making a new crown and she came back for a recall. This is a year later and I was not about to do anything for tooth number 30. So uh, another one of my favorite things to keep in mind uh, is this very robust psychologic principle called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the original article where they published this was called uh, Unskilled and Unaware. And the whole idea is when you start learning something, uh, you get pretty confident pretty quickly. Um, and then as you start to learn more about it, your confidence starts to plummet. Um, and then it never really gets back up to where you were when you knew just a little bit about it. And I feel like this with you know my own life. When I started, I was a general dentist for a few years, and when I first started, um, you know I was doing a lot of the endo in the practice. I liked endo, and after I'd been there a while, it really seemed like my cases were not doing well, um, and I didn't know what I was doing wrong. Are we mixing the sealer differently? I was wondering if they had you know changed the files. I called the manufacturer, and finally, you know, I went back and I looked at the cases that I had done when I, when I started. And you know what? Those sucked too. And I had just become more discerning as far as what I was looking for and realized, you know, the, 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 the things that I was not aware of before. So a um, couple more things that are just kind of general that I think are interesting to think about. Um, when we talk about how we perceive chances, one of the studies they'll do is they give people a lottery ticket that could be worth 300 with variable odds of winning. So if there is a 0% chance, there's no value. But 5%, there's a huge increase in the perceived value of people um, in the study. Uh, so 5% is hope. And that means something to people. 
these differences in the middle between 30 and 35, between 72 and 81, those don't really mean a whole lot to people. It does mean a lot if we can go from 95% to 100%, if we have a sure thing, but we don't have that in dentistry. You know? And it's always interesting when I speak to someone and they look at me kind of cross-eyed, like, what do you mean it might not work? I said, you know, I mean, it might not work. You know, we're, we're talking about your body here. And I'm sure you guys all have the same uh, experience. The other thing is silent evidence. And I think endodontists really uh, have a problem with this. You know, I do the root canal, uh, my 30 second recall looks fine. They leave the office and I don't see them again for a decade. And they come back for me to do a tooth on the other side. And I, hey, how's that uh, root canal doing on TV? Oh, and I see that tooth is gone. Um, and that happens, I think, much more than anodontists know. And we need to be aware of that. This is the whole you know, evil dolphin uh, theory, right? Where we all hear about the dolphin that you know, rescued the sailor and pushed him to shore. We would never hear about the dolphins that push people out to sea and, and don't rescue them, right? Because they, they don't have a, a story to tell. Confirmation bias is also a big deal. You know, if you have an idea of how things are going to be, things that fit that are going to have a big occupation in your mind. Um, I, I was just thinking of this the other day. I have two assistants. One is doing really well. One is new and training. And if the one that's doing really well hands or hands me something wrong or whatever, I'm like, gee, that's odd. Um, and if the one that is training and not doing well hands me something that's not right, I'm like, there she goes again, you know, but it might be the same frequency, right? And when these things come up that are different from what we want to believe, we really don't let the facts get in the way of what we want to believe. Um, another thing that goes into, again, this whole idea of how we're going to talk to people about where we're going with this unpredictable treatment is something called endowment effect. When we own something, it means a lot more to us. And one of the studies they did with this is there was a coffee cup on the table and people would come into the room and some of them, the coffee cup was theirs and others, the coffee cup was not theirs. And when they asked them how much would they sell the coffee cup for that was theirs, it was 10 bucks. If they asked them, the other people that didn't have the coffee cup yet, how much would they pay for it? Five bucks. So when something is ours, it means something. And we run into this in dentistry a lot. And we run into this with crowns. We run into this with implants. You know, I can't tell you how many times someone has told me, hey, be careful of my crown, you know, when I'm doing an access through them. I can't remember the last time someone said, hey, make sure you conserve lots of my natural tooth when you access through it because their tooth was free, right? Um, so implants are a thing. And we see this now where they've been there for a while and they start to have problems. And we know that this happens. And it is a big part of most periodontic practices these days uh, to try to treat this. And this is what periimplantitis looks like. And I understand from my periodontal friends that it is very difficult to treat and quite challenging. This was just today in my practice. And this patient came by, she's 82. And uh, we were uh, trying to decide whether or not to do kind of a heroic root canal on tooth number three. It doesn't show up too much on this pan, but she has several very deep class five glass ionomers. But if you look around, uh, she has an implant there on tooth number 30 that is gushing pus. And it's been that way for a few years. That implant's about 10 years old. She's got perio on that long span bridge on the left. If we, we really just need to keep things together as, as long as we can for her. And you know she's kind of running out of options, but this, this was just today. So um, we have this thing about you know, implant versus endo. And I really think that if I were good at Photoshop, I would change this because we need to have it be interchanging and leaning on each other to help it out. Uh, but the thing that we're gonna be harnessing when we're looking at trauma is this magic of what teeth bring us and these tissues that are dynamic and can heal and can change and can give rise to vital pulp therapy working and orthodontics working are the pulp, the predentin and the dentin and the cementum, the pre-cementum and the PDL. And as these are injured and repair and as we facilitate healing, that is the magic of what we do. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of get hung up with our new stuff sometimes, you know, we thought Tang was going to be better than orange juice. We thought 
formula was going to be better than breast milk and we thought margarine was going to be better than butter. You know, it turns out that, you know, teeth are now really being coveted and I am asked to do more heroic treatment now. And I think most endodontists and periodontists will echo this also. I'm asked to do more heroic treatment now than ever before. And uh, it's challenging. So um, this is the outline uh, for this evening. We'll go over the, the goals and uh, roll through all of this. Um, like I said, it'll, it'll take about two hours to get through all that. So uh, there are some things about trauma that makes it different from routine operative dentistry. Um, like I said, if this is a developing child, we might really only want to get seven or eight years out of this until they're 20 and they can have an implant, which may be where we're going. Whereas in a routine operative, that wouldn't be a real good goal. Um, most of the time, if we have immature roots and apices, we need to do what we can to help those along. We want to take into account the growth of the patient. And these teeth have been trauma, so are traumatized. So our tests need to be interpreted different. Our diagnosis needs to be um, kind of muted with different uh, areas of evidence and different pieces of evidence as far as what we're going to do in our decisions. We need to take into account the healing potential of these tissues. You know, if we're doing a crown preparation, we're not going to be expecting much healing from the dentin. But in trauma, we want to see, can the gingiva heal? Can the PDL reestablish? Can we get vital pulp therapy to work? And that leads to different requirements for our materials. And also what, what gives us this free reign to do more things is that if we have a traumatic situation, usually bacteria are not initially involved. Um, so traumatic injuries happen a lot. Um, basically 30% of everyone is going to, 30% of the population is going to have some sort of injury by the time they're 20. You used to be more uh, males and females and now that's pretty much evened up. Um, these are my three and this is kind of an old uh, picture. Um, but you remember I told you it's, it's one in three. So who is it going to be? Our money has always been on the middle daughter here, Lonnie, who is now a second year dental school because um, she was uh, kind of our active one. So um, if there is an injury here to Lonnie's teeth or Mason's teeth, it's a, it's a real problem because we've got these large pulps, we've got immature apices. Uh, Mia's dentition here is a little farther along so if we fast forward a few years now, you know, Lonnie and me are pretty much out of the woods. Mason, we still need to worry about because we've got these thin roots uh, and open apices. Um, but, you know, as we get through, as kids get older, um, the, the stakes get a little less uh, severe when there's an injury. And these two pictures were all first day of school, by the way. And this is what first day of school looks like around my house now. Everyone's gone. Uh, but, you know, now with COVID, you know, one's coming back and, and now we get to see him in dental school too. Um, so this was uh, Mia's uh, project, um, science project, and she wanted to know um, who lost teeth earlier, boys or girls. And really the only significant finding in her study was that boys didn't know when they lost their teeth and girls did, which kind of makes sense. Um, so my daughter Lonnie played water polo in college and it's a pretty rough sport. And this is a very athletic and very skilled young lady who is for some reason having a real difficult time staying above water because I'm sure Lonnie is doing something there but she's got a good poker face. Um, this was uh, Mason when he was playing flag football very young and I love this because his buddy's putting his mouthpiece in. He's smiling a little goofy because he has his mouthpiece in. And uh, don't let that sweet smile fool you. Uh, they, when they were playing water polo, they were pretty fierce. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that is going on right before they generate the need for you. And it's important, I think, for us to keep this in mind emotionally as far as our patients go. They were doing something fun and something awful You're happened. On. This oh, is what kids do. You're videoing, go. You get their head snapping back and forth. They go over a little bump, bam. Oh my great. No one lost a tooth that day. Uh, but certainly, you know, something like that could give rise to it. And then they show up. So wouldn't it be nice if we could prevent it? So um, I, you know, mouth guards are a great thing, but most of the time kids are not going to be wearing them. And most of the injuries I see, they would have never been wearing a mouth guard. You know, the injury was playing tag after dark at the church, or it was a follow through on dad's golf club. Or one of my favorites is uh, this little girl got a magic wand for Christmas 
And it turns out it works because when she waved it at her brother, his tooth disappeared. Um, so it, it's stuff like that. So we want to look more at like overjet, you know, bringing those teeth back in out of harm's way, short upper lip or incompetent lips really will increase the likelihood of having a traumatic dental injury. Mouth breathing also same thing. Mouth guards uh, can protect the teeth and alveolus, but it is, in my opinion, not fair to say that they're going to decrease concussions. There was two studies on this in cadavers, and it, it really is very shaky science, and it isn't really how concussions happen. Concussions, this is actually still advertised this way. I think this is the brain pad um, mouth guard. Uh, but concussions have to do with the acceleration of the brain in the cranial vault. They really don't have to do too much with where the energy came from. Um, so this is a good one. This was a warrior game uh, a couple of years ago. It was up. No. Uh-oh. Doug did this all himself. Boom. He's not wearing a mouth guard. Oh, man. Lost the tooth. He might have lost the tooth, too. Yes, he did. Um, I'm not sure who the Warriors team dentist is these days. Um, so I was coach of the basketball team um, this year, and I made mouth guards for everyone. These are the teeth we really need to protect with mouth guards too. Uh, transitional teeth, uh, immature apices, immature roots. And this is kind of hard to make mouth guard for. So it's important to block this out. We can just use our temporary acrylic and make our suck down splint over that. Laminated mouth guards are the best. Um, but it these are not gonna fit great in this area, but we need to have something there and they can be made for kids in that situation. So this is a pretty old article in the um, CDA journal, uh, but uh, still Ray Padilla has this website, sportsdentistry.com, uh, where he talks about mouth guard fabrication and, and being a team dentist in sports dentistry. Um, so this is what Overjet looks like, and I'm not an orthodontist, so I didn't have real good pictures of it, but you can't even see his lower incisors. And he had snagged uh, his braces on his sister's sweater. Um, and there was a little uh, luxation, but not a lot, thankfully, because uh, he had the braces there kind of acting as a splint. Uh, but that's a lot of overjet. And if we can bring that back uh, again, it, uh, I think three millimeters of overjet doubles the amount of in, uh, likelihood to having a traumatic injury. So, you know, we tried to prevent it, uh, but now it's happened and now they're coming to our office. So uh, it's important when they call that your front desk be in tune as far as how they can help manage the situation. Um, we don't put primary teeth back. There are now a few dental trauma apps that they could actually download at the scene to help. Um, but they should really ask, you know, is the patient alert and oriented? Because it might not be the best place for them to waste time coming to our offices, um, but they should know how old the patient is. And like I said, we don't put primary teeth back. So when they get to our office, we wanna know um, how things happened uh, because a blow to the anterior teeth can give crown and root fractures and bone fractures, but we don't really worry too much about posterior teeth in those situations. If we got a blow under the chin, we pretty much have to look at any tooth Padded blows, like if you fall down and hit the chair uh, arm, uh, those are likely to get root fractures and displacements. High velocity <clears throat> blows like asphalt or you know something, a ball hitting a tooth, those will give more crown fractures. Um, so this was a um, 20 year old young lady who had never had a filling in her life. She fell down rollerblading and hit her chin on the curb. And after a few days, tooth number five here became tender to biting. Uh, a few more days, it was hurting all the time. And by the time she got to my office, she had quite a toothache and tooth number five, it was necrotic. We accessed into it and this is what we saw. There is this fracture that divides this tooth in two. This is a proverbial split tooth where the fracture goes across the floor of the frication. And I had to tell this very ascetic conscious 20 year old that she was gonna lose a tooth and that didn't go over real well. So another thing um, that is part of this, and I've never been directly involved in this, and I hope I never am, uh, but we are mandated reporters if we suspect violence, uh, family violence. And this was, uh, again, kind of an old CDA uh, journal issue where they talked about this, and there's an acronym they have, and I think they still have these posters of radar where we recognize, we ask direct questions, we document the findings, we assess the patient's safety, and then review, refer, report, and it has numbers to call there. Patient safety is a biggie. Um, kids returned to a 
case of severe abuse have a high likelihood of not surviving. Um, and and it, it is something that happens a lot. Um, about 20 years ago, the, the Chicago Sun Tribune, I think, did uh, decided that anytime someone under 18 was killed, they were going to make it front page news. And they really thought it was going to be a series about gang violence. And it quickly became a series about domestic abuse. Um, and that was um, more shocking, I think, to the authors. Um, I debated whether or not to show this one. This is a traumatic dental injury. This um, two and a half year old uh, was brushing her teeth and she was standing on the vanity when she was brushing her teeth and she slipped and fell. And this is the CT, this is a toothbrush, this is her mouth and this is the back of her neck. They didn't really realize until they pulled her hair back what had happened. This was at the hospital. Fortunately, dad did not try to remove this, um, but they were able to get into the hospital room, uh, in the hospital in the OR, uh, make sure they weren't damaging any vessels and get that out. Um, and it's kind of a dramatic thing and not really teeth, but it is definitely a traumatic dental injury and something to be aware of as far as running around with a toothbrush in your, in your mouth. So where is important too, um, because uh, we want to know that they have tetanus, uh, act, tetanus activity um, and insurance and litigation because uh, I mean, a lot of times something happened, it was at a water slide or it was uh, somewhere else and uh, the patient's not necessarily the one that's going to be paying the bill. Um, when is important uh, because how long has something, uh, how long ago something happened will determine what we're going to do in our office. And we also know is there a recent trauma or return of this trauma uh, or treatment, uh, like in my case. Um, you know, one of the most inane studies I ever saw was uh, they, they took a look and found that if a child had had um, significant dental injury by the time they were eight, they were seven and a half times more likely to have another one any parent could have told you that, you know, rambunctious kids are rambunctious kids. That's, that's my mom. She would, she, if she were here, she would tell you, yeah, yeah, I knew Ken was going to bust his teeth up. Um, so now we have the history. Now we're starting to take a look. And again, we want to start global, right? We're not going to miss the mesial incisal fracture on tooth number eight. Um, but if we get really locked in on that, we might miss something more important. So we do uh, want to know, can they communicate coherently? Um, can they rotate their head? Is there paresthesia? And uh, are they dizzy, drowsy, or nauseated? If they are, we need to get them to the physician right away. Um, we can go through all the cranial nerves, right? We remember these from dental school. You know, can you smell? Can you see? Can you move your eyes? Are you having any numbness in your face? Um, are your eyes tracking normally? Can you smile? Can you frown? Um, can you hear? Can you move your tongue? It is not uncommon to have cranial nerves injured when there is trauma to the head and face. This child is trying to look straightforward. And on Monday morning, I will embarrass uh, my daughter and her friends by asking them if anyone can name what cranial nerve this is, but this is the abducens nerve that's been injured. And I understand that's one of the longest ones and it is not uncommon to have that injured when there's an injury to, to the head. So concussions, uh, there are a few different classification systems. This one seemed to make the most sense to me. Um, no loss of consciousness, but confusion that gets better in 15 minutes would be grade one. Grade two is loss of consciousness, something that, and confusion that lasts more than 15 minutes. And grade three is if they lost consciousness. Um, these are things that we need to document. Um, again, not our field to assess or uh, treat. Um, so now we're finally getting to the face and we want to start externally, make sure that they can open symmetrically and see if there's any grading of the condyle uh, that might indicate the condylar fracture or mandibular fracture. We want to check for lacerations and palpate the lips and mucosa because there could be tooth fragments <clears throat> in the lips and mucosa that could either wind up being a nidus for infection or that's a very nice restorative material if we can get the fractured tooth segment back etch and just bond that back on the tooth. So heart tissues, we want to know how many teeth are there, malpositioned teeth, occlusal plane discrepancies and mobility. Um, I don't really know anyone that uses a rubber wheel anymore to look for crust fractures, but you know, have them bite around on a Q-tip or a tooth sleuth uh, to see if anything lights up. Um, pulp tests, it's really important that we do them initially 
but we need to interpret them much differently than if they had not just had an injury because it's a baseline only. Um, and I'm talking about cold and electric tests to see if something responds inside the tooth. And we need to know that we could have false negatives, that they might not feel cold or they might not feel the electric pulp tester initially, but after a while that can be regained, um, sometimes up to like six months. Um, it kind of depends on symptom symptomatology to me. Um, if I have a tooth and I darn well should be feeling cold at a month and it's not, I'm probably going to do the root canal on an adult tooth like that, um, an immature tooth, maybe not. Um, so we want to retest and follow up on these because we don't want to lose something that is um, heading south. So again, in trauma, it's really, there are more things in play when we decide whether we're going to treat or not. So um, I, I like this graph because it, it kind of shows um, kind of my philosophy on, on endo. Um, we know that there's a distribution of, of responses. So we've got the normal pulp, let's say, and then we've got irreversible pulpitis, let's say. And let's say this is a cold test. And we have a distribution. Some people you can put cold on the test, they won't feel anything. Most, yeah, I feel a little bit, okay, it goes away. And then some, you got to peel them off the ceiling. It's the most awful thing you've ever done. Why did you do that um, when you do a cold test? And they're actually normal. And then we have pulpitis where some don't respond a lot. Most respond more. So if I've decided that I don't want to miss any irreversible pulpitis because I'm worried about them having a flare up, then I'm going to draw my positive criteria right here. So I'm going to pick up all of the people with irreversible pulpitis. The problem is I'm also going to pick up these people that have normal pulps, but just responded a lot. So this leads to over treatment. And this, you're going to have this crossover here. We don't get to decide whether we're going to be right or wrong. But what we can do is decide which way we want to be wrong. So if I'm going to decide that, you know what, I do not want to treat any teeth that might have a chance of recovering, then I need to accept that I'm going to miss some on my first time through but I don't want to treat any of these normal ones. So you have to then move your, your criteria a little bit more on this scale to the right. And the nice thing about um, endo is we're still really pretty much talking about a root canal. <clears throat> you know, we can have some issues with resorptions in, um, in trauma, but for the most part, if someone comes to my office and I think, you know, I'm not sure you need a root canal today. Um, and then a month or a year later, they need a root canal. We're still pretty much doing a root canal. It's not like chest pain, you know, where we really need to get on it. So I'm comfortable with that. Um, but it's something to be thought of in trauma too, because it, it's not as clear, especially if um, we're not sure about our pulp tests. So the thing that I think we need to remember um, in dentistry is that some interventions help, but all interventions harm. I mean, if we get someone numb for a buckle class five, you know, that's an injection, that's a harm. There better be a good reason for it. You know, if we're doing root canal treatment, you know, yeah, it's, it's predictable. That's what I do for a living, but sure be better if we could avoid it. So some interventions help, but anytime we touch a patient, there is a harm. We hope the help outweighs the harm. So um, this patient was in non-contact uh, football practice at De La Salle High School out here. <clears throat> and he was a receiver and they were wearing pads. He ran out for a pattern, though there was a ball thrown, the DB and he collided. And he smashed the left side of his face on the uh, defensive backs um, pads. And he was sent for me to do root canals on uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And I think nine had actually been displaced. Um, and yes, none of these teeth responded to pulp tests. But if you look, this is where they had placed the screw and plate um, above here, right where the uh, middle superior alveolar nerve would come through and should be innervating all these teeth, but in this case it wasn't. So a lack of response from a tooth doesn't mean the pulp is dead. And our vitality tests should really not be called vitality tests. They should be sensibility tests because we just are trying to figure out if there is nerve inside the tooth that can still scream when we provoke it that doesn't really mean that there is or isn't blood supply necessarily. We think it's a proxy for it. Uh, but again, sensibility tests. <clears throat> so 
everything on the, his right side was responding normally. Um, since we knew that there was a significant displacement of tooth number nine, we did do root canal treatment on that. Uh, but then when he came back uh, and had a more kind splint on his teeth, now all of these teeth on his left side were responding normally to pulp tests. And I think this was now two months later. So yeah, no root canal indicated. It was just because of his injury. So when we have radiographs from someone that has received trauma, we need to take multiple angles and talk about a few things in our interpretation that wouldn't normally be on there in terms of apical closure and what the pulp space looks like, how close is that fracture to the pulp and if we see any root fractures. And then we need to follow up, you know, six weeks, six months and yearly for a while. Um, and it's important to get that through to, pa to patients and their parents. We also wanna take different vertical angles of our radiographs. Um, if we change that, then we might be able to uh, catch the plane of this fracture. If we take the radiograph at our normal angle, we're not going to see this. So if we make it a little too steep and a little too shallow on others, we can pick up these fractures that we wouldn't see normally. Now, most of you practice now in a community and in an era where CBCT is readily attainable. And I believe it is a must have tool for treating trauma. If there has been displacement in trauma, I believe it's standard of care to get a CT. And standard of care is, is defined by what a reasonable practitioner would do in your community. I think I'm a reasonable guy. Um, it is pretty easy to get it and it is, uh, takes a lot of this artwork and guesswork out of it. <clears throat> so this was a patient of mine and it was interesting because um, obviously he hadn't, this wasn't his first issue uh, with his front teeth. And, you know, it has occurred to me in talking to him that if you ever want to meet an innocent person minding their own business, you should hang out outside a bar at two in the morning because everyone I've ever talked to had been outside a bar at two in the morning was just minding their own business. Um, and he was just minding his own business when he got socked in the face um, and had this mid root fracture on tooth number nine Then tooth number eight obviously had some issues a while back. <clears throat> um, we actually, this actually wasn't mobile and was not symptomatic, believe it or not. So we did actually treat this tooth and we just treated the coronal segment. Um, so like I said, I think CBCT is a must have for this. And there's a couple things I wanna to talk to you about on CBCT that might not be um, what you've heard uh, before on it. First of all, take a look at this plus sign and just stare at it on your screen and you will see a green dot moving around on the outside. And if you stare at that plus sign long enough and hard enough, all the pink dots go away and all you see is the green. And then if you take your gaze out to those pink dots, you'll see that there is no green dot. The, or excuse me, yeah, there is no green dot. All you're seeing is the fatigue of your retina when it's turned off from the pink, you perceive green. Uh, and there is no green there that you believe you're seeing. I like this one too, because we're hardwired to think that something that's in the shadow must be lighter than something that's in the sun. We can't unsee this. Um, we see a gray box, uh, a gray top and a white bottom, but those are the exact same shade. <clears throat> there, are, there is no difference in what would be density on a CT. What is difference is the, is the background and the shadowing. Also, I love this one because it depends on how we look at things, right? And this, is, I think, is a great illustration of why CBCT can be so important. One way it's a circle, the other way it's a square. Now, you guys know I'm trying to trick you, so you'll probably be aware of this, but everyone reads 12, 13, 14 on the top, and everyone reads A, B, C on the bottom. Our mind effortlessly fills in the blanks on something like this because it's what we expect and it's the context. But if you look, that middle character is exactly the same in both things. It is a 13 if you want it to be a 13, and it's a B if you want it to be a B. <clears throat> the other thing is, if you look at the screen right now, you probably just see a bunch of black and white dots. But if we put it in motion, you can clearly see the Dalmatian. <clears throat> I was at UOP yesterday, and a student wanted me to do a consult. And she had a report of a CT that was taken from ortho, and it had one screenshot of this tooth that had a root canal treatment a year and a half ago, and there were some radiolucencies a couple different places. 
And one screenshot without being able to move back and forth was, was almost no information. Um, we need this movement and it helps us out as far as what we're looking at. So I like this one too. If we look, it's narrowing. And as it gets closer, it becomes Albert. Now the picture is not changing at all, but the high frequency things are Albert. The low frequency things like cheekbones and forehead are Marilyn. So if we're looking at an image, we may see something different if we're zoomed in versus zoom out. So it's important to look at different perspectives. Um, so this, this will be a little different since we're not in the same room, <clears throat> but I want you to take a look and you're just gonna have to answer this for yourselves. I'm gonna show you a radiograph and I just want you to mentally think about all the stuff you can see. And it's not gonna be up very long. Most of you kind of went through that. And if we unmuted everyone now, you'd be able to tell me many things about that. People would say, oh yeah, radiolucency, yeah, frication radiolucency, open margin, yeah, two crowns, you know, good, you know, par good pair of bone height. And we do that effortlessly. And that was about seven tenths of a second. And we have that intuitive um, mindset with radiographs because we've been looking at so many of them for so long and we know what to expect. Remember I told you at the very beginning, it's hard to unlearn something. If you know that that's what you're seeing on this black and white x-ray, then you're seeing something that looks a lot like an x-ray, like a slice from a CT. You effortlessly fill in your CT, like the ABC 12, 13, 14, you fill in what you expect on your interpretation of CBCT. And it's important to back up and try to be more disciplined about how you're reviewing those images. Um, this was part of the Colleagues for Excellence that went out about six years, four years ago um, on CBCT and how helpful it is. And I was one of the reviewers on this. My committee on the AAE put this out. And if you look at it, it makes sense, right? This is a CT coronal slice through the powell root of a symptomatic molar demonstrating ledging and perforation. Yeah, you can see that. And you can see how you really wouldn't be able to pick that up on a regular radiograph. And they say, this is the Powell root. It kind of looks like the Powell root. So this is the Powell root, and then this is the buckle. So this should be the Powell bone going over this way. And then this is the cheek. And what are these? These are the turbinates. Are the turbinates to the Powell or to the buckle of an upper molar? I don't think so. This is completely mislabeled. This is actually the buckle root. Um, and everyone missed it, including me. And this went out. If you look at this Colleagues for Excellence, it's still in there. And it, it's an embarrassment to me. But the point is, if this were a radiograph, no one would have missed it. It would have leapt off the page at us and we said, oh yeah, that's, that's a buckle root. Uh, but because we are not as intuitive on CT, uh, we get confused. So, um, I know this isn't necessarily trauma, but it's important because I say uh, CBCT is important when we're treating trauma. Um, and beam hardening is something that everyone needs to understand if you're gonna be looking at CTs. When the photon comes out of the generator, they're not all the same energy and they encounter a material that's going to attenuate that photon. Some photons are going to make it through, the more high energy photons make it through the less high energy are stopped by whatever that is, a post, gutta percha, or a crown, some make it through. These high energy ones that make it through are then going to fly through anything that's downstream of that. So keep in mind, a CT is a computer reconstruction, is not the image that we're used to when we do a film or a digital radiograph. And it has to know that whatever was downstream of this things went through it really easily. Photons went through it real easily. So it must not be very dense. And that's what the value is that the computer puts on that. And it makes it look, it makes it look dark, which is low density. So if we look like around restorations, we see the shadows. That is not that there's a problem there. That is just beam hardening because there's something radio opaque next door. Um, this is beam hardening too. And, I, I really do feel that today, probably somewhere in the Bay Area, 
a tooth with the root canal on it that was completely asymptomatic was extracted because someone misinterpreted beam hardening as a root fracture and thought, oh boy, we better get it out before there's bone loss. Um, so again, that's beam hardening there. That is not uh, something going on with the root. And I love this one because I was searching for this mesiobuccal canal. I, I went a long way down and I couldn't find it. But when we have this slice, we see the beam hardening from the lingual gutta percha I already had in there. And it looks like the most wide open, easy to find canal you would ever expect. And I can tell you, there was nothing there. This is just beam hardening. I was using this just to see if I was still centered in the root. Um, but that is, that is completely artifact. And imagine if that were just on right in the PDL, it would really look like a fracture. Um, so this is one more um, example of beam hardening. When we have implants on one side, they will cast a shadow this way. This is beam hardening here. We can understand that. But when it comes from the other side and then gets cast in this area too from the other implant, uh, that makes it a little more difficult to interpret. Scatter is another problem <clears throat> with uh, CBCT, and it has to do with things coming in and bouncing off a little sideways. So it comes out of the generator, hits something, and then goes sideways. Now, since we have a big panel in cone beam CT, and we're only going around one time, it gets registered on other areas of the detector and tends to cloud things up. In medical CT, where it's a thin beam and a thin detector, if it gets off, it just doesn't get detected. It goes away from where the thin detector is versus RCT where it all winds up. And so what happens is it makes things very cloudy if there's lots of radio opaque things in the image. This is obviously not very diagnostic around these cast posts and cores. Um, so, you know, CT is, is useful, um, but we, we still, I think are kind of in, um, figuring it out what CBCT images mean, especially in trauma. <clears throat> this was a CBCT I took of this uh, child who had injured uh, tooth number eight. Um, and this was, I think, one week after trauma. And there definitely is something here. Um, at that point, she still had a little bit of a response to cold. And I was hoping maybe that she would regain it. Um, and we do get inflammation around teeth. We get transient apical breakdown after injuries. And it's part of healing. Um, so I elected to not do anything for her at that time. Uh, she came back in a month and it was starting to get a little tender to percussion. And this looked like it was evolving to me. There was now, you know, like it's defending, uh, the bone is trying to defend itself, making it a little bit more dense. And it had kind of pushed out a little bit more. Um, so I elected at this point to say, you know, we need to start doing root canal treatment on it. Um, when I accessed into the coronal portion, there was no visible pulp. When I got halfway down a root, she said, ow. Um, and I pulled out the pulp and this is what it looked like. Um, sometimes if I get a pulp out of one piece, I'll just throw it in formalin and then I can take them to UOP and they'll do some histo on them for me. Um, but this was the apical area and this is still very much alive. Uh, these are bacteria on the periphery, but inside in the middle, this isn't very inflamed. Um, and, you know, again, we have this idea that our pulp uh, tests are giving us an uh, a accurate view of what's going on inside there, but really it's more transient. You know, the pulp doesn't just decide one day that it's necrotic, and that's what was going on with her. Um, so if we do try to do vital pulp therapy, we need to take this into account every now and then. This was, uh, I thought, a great opportunity to do uh, vital pulp therapy. We did direct pulp cap on tooth number eight, and that's the way he went away. At that point, I was saying, okay, this is reversible pulpitis. We fixed it. Then he came back. There was this periapical radiolucency. Um, now it was not responding to cold. I mean, everyone sees that periapical radiolucency there, right? It's, it's pretty easy to see. Um, initiated root canal therapy. And this is what came out of his pulp. Oh, sorry, um, got ahead of my slide. So the idea is teeth can die without it hurting. We see this all the time, right? pulpitis is not always painful. So when they looked at 500 teeth here, they found out um, that not everyone experienced pain. About 40% of people had no pain when the pulp died. So this is what the pulp looked like in that uh, young man that I did the direct pulp cap on. This is fairly normal at the apex. This was dead in the middle of the root and contaminated with bacteria. 
but this was fairly normal. And if we go downstream over this way, the periapical area, that's where the radiolucency was. And remember, periapical radiolucencies are inflammation. They aren't evidence of infection. Mm, probably could have taken those out. Um, and I love this case because this really, again, it is not necessarily trauma, but it really is an important case to show in trauma because this is what we need to be thinking about. Um, this young lady had pain dividing on tooth number 30, and it makes sense, right? So you've got a lot of decay here, periapical radiolucency. We all see this well-established periapical radiolucency here. Uh, when I looked in her mouth, this is what I saw. She had a pulp polyp growing out of this exposure on tooth number 30. And what hurt was she was chomping on her pulp when she would eat something. So this was not necrosis by any stretch of the imagination. This was hyperplastic. Um, so I thought, well, yeah, let's get that out of there and see what we can do. Turns out that we do get radiolucencies on teeth, especially young people's teeth. Um, and they often will respond to pulp testing when we still have these radiolucencies. Because the last thing to die inside of a pulp is the nerve tissue, right? Because cell bodies are a ways away and it can persist even with severe inflammation and we'll get these periapical changes, especially in kids um, before there's total necrosis of the pulp. And that's important to remember, periapical radiolucency is evidence of inflammation. Like when we see bone loss in a periodontal pocket, it's not because everything's dead there, it's because the bone is responding to inflammation in the periodontal pocket, same thing inside of a tooth. So this is what her pulp polyp looked like when I incised it and did histo on that. This is actually a little bit of a blood clot and there's acute and chronic inflammation in this area where her pulp had grown out of her tooth. So um, I thought this was a neat opportunity to try vital pulp therapy. So this was a rather large pulp exposure that I was able to stop the bleeding with these racelet pellets. Um, that's what we had. So I put uh, MTA over that and then I put a glass ionomer over that and that's how she left. She came back um, at three months and had dislodged the temporary. Um, so I wanted to replace it. I removed the old glass ionomer and this is what I saw at three months. This is where that enormous pulp exposure was. It had all filled in when it was paired of dentin. There was a little bit of exposed pulp still here in the middle. Um, so we replaced that restoration, but this is what she had when she came in and again, radiolucency and a root that's not exactly mature. At six months after vital pulp therapy, this is what she looked like. Radiolucency um, healing and um, some reparative dentin underneath where we had the pulp cap placed. <clears throat> so that, again, it's not trauma, but it's something to keep in mind uh, about harnessing the healing potential of a pulp. And I love this quote. Uh, I wouldn't know it if it weren't for the world, uh, for the movie Wayne's World, once you label me, you negate me. And I feel that we do that to the pulp. We have five, five names we put on it. What's really happening in a pulp is much more dynamic than that. Um, so this is my office and I will do this type of thing. If you look at the literature uh, with the modern materials, vital pulp therapy is about as successful as root canal therapy. And if I'm gonna say, gee, let's try a retreatment before we go to an implant, I need to back up and say, gee, let's try vital pulp therapy before we go to root canal, if we can. Um, because you know we feel like we can always take the next step, but we wanna exhaust these more conservative steps first. So this is a BC putty and that's how she left. So um, after someone has been um, injured, there are a few things we wanna do for everyone. Uh, we wanna have them on soft diet for two weeks. Uh, we want to have a soft bristle toothbrush after each meal. We like them on chlorhexidine, although I understand that's coming out of favor a little bit. Um, and we need diligent recall. And we have to tell them these teeth are damaged. And it is amazing, again, the blank looks I get from parents and mostly and kids too, when it's okay, well, these teeth are never gonna be the same. You know, um, my teeth, they're for smiling mostly. You know, if I do corn on the cob, I use my lower teeth. Apple, I kind of get it over on the side. Um, because if I do too much with these broken teeth, they're not going to withstand it. You know, and I was you know, I should have thought of that before I dove it in the pool. Um, and it's important to tell that to people. And also way down the road, 40 years later, you can wind up 
needing root canal treatment on a tooth. And I always tell people, you know, I don't have root canals on mine yet, uh, but I could get a pulpitis next week. And it would be because of that injury when I was 10. So again, the treatment concepts are uh, these teeth are injured. We want to manage the tissues. We want to use materials and techniques to be conservative. And we need to balance the whole idea that healing can take place versus the risk of waiting and having something go south on us. And that's a really tough thing to figure out. So timing is varied. If it's emergent, acute, we wanna have them right away because prognosis can plummet if too much time elapse. Um, Subacute would be 24 to 48 hours. And then delayed is at mutual convenience. And you'll see this kind of uh, delineated on some of the slides. So uh, now uh, we're finally gonna get to actual dental treatment and what I've been, I've been talking 45 minutes. Um, so crown fractures, uh, they come in a few varieties. If there's just an infraction where there is a line in the enamel or dentin, um, no dental tissue is lost. Uh, we really don't have to do much, maybe a bonding agent. If it's in the enamel, we can smooth it and restore if it's an aesthetic issue. Um, that's something that's a subacute or delayed. Um, so this is Michael and it was interesting. Uh, he had injured, they were most worried about tooth number eight. And if you look, there's this little bleeding in the sulcus that is a result of his injury. It's not because he wasn't brushing his teeth. When I transilluminated this though, this is what it looked like on tooth number nine and mom was in the room and she's like, oh my God, look at that. I said, yes, that is an issue. And we're not gonna do anything right now. This is the in infraction. Um, but if this develops a pulpitis, that could be from that, this might be something that we need to think about doing a veneer someday. Um, if it's in the dentin, uh, uncomplicated, not involving the pulp, we wanna seal the tubules by placing a suitable composite restoration, uh, possibly with a base, glass ionomer base, and that's subject to delay it also. Uh, we do wanna follow these up. However, we don't wanna just let these sit because it's not the same thing as caries getting to the dent. And this is cleaved. The dentin tubules are open. They can certainly be an avenue for bacteria to enter the pulp and cause it to become necrotic. But there's a good prognosis for those. <clears throat> so this is Elizabeth and she fell down rollerblading also. And uh, she was rather uh, worked up when she came to my office. It's not very often actually that uh, the, uh, the, as an endodontist and I'm the first person in, usually the restorative dentist is. Um, but she came to my office first. This is actually a little asphalt uh, that she had ground into that tooth when she hit the pavement. And if we look a little bit more closely, again, she's got this little bleeding in the sulcus. That's an injury and that's something that we need to be aware of and document um, because in a decade, that might be an area where she gets resorption and is more likely to get resorption. So these we want to restore with minimal finishing. Um, and these were all responding normally when I test them uh, with cold. And this is how it looked when she left my office. And a lot of you restorative hot shots might have a good laugh at my aesthetic dentistry. Uh, but believe me, she thought they looked great. And in a couple of weeks, we'll have her back and polish those uh, down to make them look a little better. Because we don't want to do anything more. We don't want to use our soft flex discs and put more composite dust and injury into the sulcus and heat up that pulp uh, any more than we have to. So when it involves the pulp, we call those complicated. And I really feel that we need to first try to maintain that vitality of the pulp if it's all possible, especially in um, a developing kid when we got thin dentinal walls and wide open apices. So vital pulp therapy can work and we anesthetize the tooth. Uh, we'll clean out, I'm not sure, there, is that better? It's weird, I'm lecturing into the Zoom abyss. I'm just sitting here in my living room. I don't know if you guys are even still there. Um, so I'm not even sure if you can see my video thing. I'm gonna mess that. Um, so we can rinse that with uh, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, we used to say uh, chlorhexidine, but uh, it turns out sodium hypochlorite is a good thing to use for that. And we can use that also to arrest the bleeding um, or saline. Um, MTA is placed over the exposure site or um, some other bioceramic. And then glass ionomer is placed over the bioceramic. Um, the surrounding dentin can be then etched and restored. Um, it's amazing to me that books still talk about calcium hydroxide and vital pulp therapy 
Um, I just, I don't really think it has a place there anymore. I mean, MTA has been tested more than any other material probably in the history of dentistry. Um, and there are all kinds of knockoffs now that basically use the same idea of these bioceramics. So this is what MTA looks like. Bioceramics, um, the first one was MTA and it was developed at Loma Linda when I was there. And it was kind of a neat thing to be a part of because it really felt like I was at the epicenter of endodontics at that time. And it's really modified Portland cement. It is not Portland cement. When MTA came out, it was so expensive. People realized that, hey, you know, it's the same stuff that Home Depot sells. Not quite, you know, Home Depot sells Portland cement that has lead in it, some traces of arsenic and other things. MTA does not have that, but it's a high pH and the high pH helps induce mineralization. Um, and it turns out to be something that's very kind to the pulp and periapical tissues. So there are a few other ones available. The problem with MTA is some of the radio pacifiers in it will cause it to stain and they all stain. I've done a ton and not a ton, but I've done many uh, regenerative cases or pulp anterior pulp cap cases with MTA. They are all coming back very dark. So I do not use white or gray MTA anymore in the anterior. Um, a better material to use is, um, interesting. A better material to use is uh, biodentin. Biodentin um, is the same type of material. I find it's better if I crack it open and mix it on my mixing pad rather than triturate with the fluid that they, they uh, bring with it. Um, this is a study where they just kind of followed the two materials, biodentin and MTA over time after doing vital pulp therapy. Um, and really the take home here is they both work pretty well. They're both, you know, around 90% and, you know, the best success rates in endo right around 90%. So the other one that we're using a lot these days too, is this, uh, Brasser BC putty, the fast set. Um, and that can be used, uh, similar to MTA. Epexogenesis is what we like to do when we keep the pulp alive, all of it, and we get thickening of the roots and we get closure of the apex. Kind of an old concept is apexification, where we used to try to just develop a barrier at the end of the root. Um, so again, bottle pulp therapy is important. This is Cody, he fell off the bars. This is what I'm going to wanna to see if I'm going to do vital pulp therapy, something that bleeds a little, but not a lot. So there is something there, there is blood supply to affect healing, um, but uh, I can stop it. It's not so inflamed that it's going to be an issue with my restorative material. So if I can stop that bleeding, I'm gonna place my MTA over that. At that point, I wouldn't use MTA anymore. And then glass animal over that. And I also removed this little fractured root segment. And that's how he left that day, not necessarily an aesthetic restoration yet, but he was gonna come back the next week and go upstairs to the general dentist and have something that looks better. This is a very old slide. This slide is um, 25 years old. He's a police officer now, and he has not had a root canal treatment on this tooth yet. And to me, that's success. That is successful management of trauma. So we wanna follow those up also three weeks, three months, six months and yearly, and something like that has a good prognosis. So um, we like to do vital pulp therapy for incompletely formed roots, small exposures, a few hours old. I really feel if I can stop the bleeding on something, I'm going to try vital pulp therapy. I'm not really too concerned with how old it is. You know, the sooner the better, obviously. We don't do vital pulp therapy for teeth with mature apices, I meaning kind of an adult tooth that's been displaced. That's just not a good bet to have that, have enough blood supply to heal. So uh, we like to do pulpotomy where we remove a little bit of the affected pulp and teeth with larger exposures and immature roots. We usually don't have to go ahead and do pulp pulpectomy after pulpotomy, meaning just because we see this filling material that's down to the CEJ, we do not then to have to follow up and do root canal treatment. And it's a problem because that's just probably not going to be responding to pulp testing. So we need to rely on things like percussion and what it looks like on CT. Uh, if some time down the road, we want to do root canal treatment on it. Uh, but usually we don't have to if it's been done right. Um, so for the pulpotomy, same thing. We want to remove a little bit of the pulp with a round diamond and lots of water. Um, we can place the calcium hydroxide over there or a bioceramic. Like I said, I would do bioceramic. 
and then we'll restore it um, and then follow them up the same way. Good prognosis for these. So um, this was a young lady who had fallen down uh, playing uh, volleyball in Reno and she'd skidded across the floor and her head snapped and she uh, in fractured the incisal on uh, tooth number eight there. And you see it had composite placed on it, uh, but I thought that we had a good shot at doing vital pulp therapy. So here I'm using the diamond round burr and there should be more water there. At that time I was rinsing this with more chlorhexidine, but we can use sodium hypochlorite also. There is some issue with sodium hypochlorite making it a little bit more difficult to bond um, you can kind of just take care of that with a finishing burr or sodium ascorbate. I like these racelet pellets sometimes to stop bleeding, uh, but a lot of times in vital pulp therapy, I'm just going to be using a sodium hypochlorite soaked pellet. So once we get the bleeding to stop, then we're going to place the bioceramic over that. <clears throat> I like these small carriers for that. It's important then to get the bioceramic back away from your cavo surface because bioceramics don't set real well and they are not meant to withstand oral fluids. So if you have say a resorption repair that you're doing and you think it's going to be exposed to saliva, use a glass ionomer, do not use a bioceramic. So then I put a little uh, glass ionomer over that, that was Fuji 9. And then she had brought the fractured segment and I was going to use that as the final restoration. Uh, so I had troughed that out Turns out they had kept it in full strength bleach because they were very fastidious and we didn't have a very good color match. Um, so we went ahead and just did regular composite for her. <clears throat> so that's how she left. Another little trick is to make a little moat or a little dike of uh, some sort of material around the exposure. You could use a uh, glass ionomer or sometimes people will use dical for that to kind of circle the exposure. So now when you put a bioceramic on there, it's got a little bit more bulk to it. And then you can put glass ionomer over that because you know, it's kind of hard to make them stay in these situations of anterior teeth, uh, like Tegan here who had this exposure on the mesial of tooth number nine, was able to get a little bioceramic on that and then put glass ionomer over that and then remove uh, what was left of this little uh, fractured root segment and that's how he left. He never wound up having a root canal on that tooth. Um, but what I was really concerned about with him is how we we're going to manage this area with tooth number eight had been avulsed. And I thought it would be a great indication to do auto transplantation where we could take tooth number 20 and put it in this area. Um, but the oral surgeon and the um, orthodontist didn't want to do it because they were worried that then they would lose two teeth. But this would have been the perfect indication because the roots are open. A lot of times you don't even need to do root canal on a tooth where you auto transplant it like that. Um, so this is just kind of a, a busy slide that talks about Theracal, Biodentin and Pro Root. Theracal, I'm, I think it may have actually been pulled. It didn't do very well in the study. Biodentin and Pro Root do. Um, so um, I honestly cannot remember this young man's name, but this is how he showed up and he was not happy to be there that day. Um, I think this was a basketball injury um, and this is what he looked like and he wasn't a very compliant patient to begin with either. Um, but he did actually rally and once I got him numb and he kind of felt like we were all on his side, he wound up doing really well. Um, so for him, he had brought these segments uh, that he had cracked off with him, the parents had. Um, so this was a case where there were pulp exposures and I used these segments as the definitive restoration. This was, um, I don't know where that x-ray is. So this is um, BC putty under, over the exposure. And then we put a little glass ionomer over those and then we looted them on uh, just by etching both sides um, and uh, using bonding agents. So that's how we left that day. Um, I wish I had a better picture of it, but uh, he really wanted to get out of the office by then. Um, and that was not that long to do that. And he came in that mess that you saw and he left like that and he was pretty happy about it. So this was another interesting one where the patient had injured tooth number eight. And uh, as I was speaking with her before I took a look, she said, you know, my tooth bleeds. And I'm thinking, mm, right, your, your, your gums bleed is what you mean, but okay, fine. Yeah, your tooth bleeds. And so we talked about it for a little bit. 
And then when I pulled back her look, lip and took a look, no, her, her tooth was bleeding. It was cracked here um, across the middle of the facial and then it went subgingival on the lingual. Um, so I wasn't sure what we were going to get with that. You could not really even see the fracture on the lingual. Uh, but once I removed it, this is what we had. Uh, and this is a very aesthetic conscious uh, woman with a very high lip line. Um, so I thought, well, you know, we got a shot and this is just on the lingual. So I used some of the opal dam green to put over the gingiva so that we wouldn't have um, contamination or injury of the gingiva by irrigating in that area. Um, then root canal treatment was fairly easy to do on that tooth once we had isolation and then put a dental dam over where the opal dam green was. Then when I did my buildup, I was able to mande post inside there. And now the tooth has root canal treatment on it, there isn't necessarily uh, a need to cover all of this lingual. So where this actually had a reasonable emergence profile, we could just leave it uh, and then have the crown margin be a little bit superior to that. And that's how she left. Need to follow up with her. So uh, this was another interesting crown fracture. This uh, young lady, um, she had had an injury and she went to the dentist and everything looked okay. Um, and then she said that she was eating licorice and her tooth like flicked out and then came back. And no one really knew what she was talking about. Um, so I took a look at it and everything looked okay, but I thought this looked a little suspicious right on the incisal edge. Turns out that somehow in this injury, she had just cleaved off the facial enamel of tooth number eight. And she was right. When she pulled the licorice, it flicked out and came back. Um, so in her case, uh, there was a pretty large exposure and this is where uh, the fracture came out of the facial. We went ahead and did again, opal dam green, isolated, did root canal treatment on what was left of the tooth. And then I thought, gee, we have this, what looks like a perfect veneer. So I adjusted that. I brought a little bit of the you know, gingival portion back. We isolated this area. We put some Teflon tape on either side, etched, bonded, and we put this now enamel veneer back on the tooth. And that's how she left. And I thought that was pretty slick. And um, I think she was 14 at this time. So I think it's way better than pulling the tooth and doing an implant. When I saw her for recall, I was very disappointed to see the gingiva looking like this. And I was hoping that when I took a recall CT that I would see some excess cement that had escaped and I it didn't. This is just the way she's reacting to the procedures that we did. And now I suppose we could extrude this tooth a little bit if we wanted to. Um, but, you know, again, if we can keep this tooth there for another handful of years and then, you know, probably an implant when she's 20 um, or talking to the orthodontist to see about possibly extruding that and then doing maybe a little aesthetic crown lengthening to match everything up. Um, and I think that extruding teeth is something that we need to think about. Um, this patient was referred to me to do root canal treatment on tooth number 23. It's like, I don't see 23, but it was there. And this was a motor vehicle accident. Um, and this was a while back. Um, she was also a smoker and she didn't have a whole lot of means. Um, and that's kind of a tough place to place an implant. So we did root canal treatment on that tooth. It actually had two canals. Uh, we devised this hook, cemented it in there. And then since she had this lingual bar, we just wrapped an elastic up around that. Um, and that tooth came up real quickly. And again, when we're extruding teeth, we're not moving them through bone. We're just kind of stretching the ligament and it will come up real fast. Uh, one mistake I made on this, I didn't do a fibrotomy um, around this tooth. And it's really interesting, but I think it is for a lecture purpose, it really shows what the magic of the attachment apparatus can do for us. So this was two months stabilization and this was three months. And look, the bone actually came with this. It dragged the bone up and teeth will do that when we extrude them and we can use that even if we know the teeth is coming out to make a better implant site. Um, so we did do a little crown lengthening thing for her. And then we did the post and crown and this is at six years. I think that's a pretty nice result. So follow up after these injuries, um, there can be four things, too good, too bad. Repair, I think is good. Mineralization or obliteration, I also think is good. And there is no need to rush and do the root canal treatment when you start to see a, a, a tooth mineralizing. We used to think, oh, we better do it while you still can. Turns out that a mineralized tooth will need root canal treatment about 10% of the time. 
a root canal treated tooth will be successful about 90% of the time. They're the same thing. So again, we lose, we leave those alone if they develop symptoms, then we try to treat. And with microscopes, we can usually find the canal. Internal resorption is a bad result from trauma and necrosis can be a real bad result. So this is uh, necrosis on tooth number eight with a periapical radiolucency and a large pulp space. This patient is 11. This is pulp canal obliteration on these two teeth. These look like they're 90 year old's teeth. So, oh, this is, I uh, just thought I'd wake you guys up with this. Uh, this was trauma and this person had quite a tooth thick on teeth number eight and we access it, this is what it looks like. And this makes the day of the endodontist and the assistants too. When they see pus like that draining out of a tooth, my assistants get pretty excited about it. And I always think, my gosh, that must have hurt because they're not swollen, right? All of that pus is in their alveolus and it comes out when we get to make this little tiny opening um, in the tip of their root. So that was just trauma and how it can be, that would be necrosis. So open apex, um, there are a few ways to deal with that. Um, this is uh, Jessica, and this is a very old slide. Um, when I tested these teeth, both eight and nine were necrotic, and I told Jessica and her mom that she needed root canals on them. They both cried in my operatory. And I said, don't worry about it. We have this thing called apexification. Uh, it's gonna be just fine. I'm gonna see you several times over the next 18 months. We're going to be removing the calcium hydroxide and putting it back in there and waiting for a barrier to develop. We're gonna get you numb every single time. We're gonna keep that in there. At 18 months, uh, I think we'll probably get a barrier. At that point, we'll go ahead and we'll seal the end of the root and we'll get a real nice result of healing at the tip of the root, which is exactly what we did. And this is how she left. I had her back uh, for a six month recall. This was actually back when uh, it was films. This was probably like 1996. And the assistant was coming in after having developed the film as I was talking to um, Jessica. And she said, you know, they were doing just fine. But this, this one on this side, I was eating an apple and I heard a little click up there and it's been a little sore since then. And this was what the radiograph looked like. And this is a disaster. And this is exactly what happened with a lot of these teeth where we did long-term calcium hydroxide and we didn't do anything to reinforce these roots. And hooray for the endodonts, we got this nice healing here, but this is a catastrophic failure. Um, and there, isn't, there aren't a whole lot of good options. I think she was 13 at this time. So we gotta do better. So uh, this was my research when I was at Loma Linda and we were looking for ways to make apexification happen faster in immature dog teeth. When what we did was bone growth factors in some roots and we got some amazing results. And actually we used uh, OP1. This was 25, 27 years ago before it came to market. And we got a lot of calcification at the apex, but one of our groups was MTA. And it turns out that did really well. This is what it looked like uh, when we didn't do anything. This is what MTA looked like. And we have bone growing right up to the MTA, which was a little bit of an overfill actually of the MTA at the apex. And this was a very consistent result. And this was the first illustration of MTA in open apex. And the Beckman Institute lost two of my samples. So I didn't have statistical balance and I couldn't publish. And that really bummed me out because this was the first use of MTA to obturate an open apex. So after we obturate the apex, then we need to reinforce things. We can use these uh, fiber reinforced composite post technologies to bond inside roots and regain some of this critical strength here in the pericervical area that has lost in some of these teeth with real thin roots. I'm not gonna bore you with how we do that. You guys know how to do that. Um, that's what it looks like on recall. So there is kind of a debate on trying to do regeneration, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, or obturating it with the bioceramic. And uh, it turns out they're pretty equal. Um, and we have issues with patient compliance on the regeneration procedures that we don't with MTA. And with MTA, we can then immediately uh, bond post inside here to try to regain some of the strength. So this is a good indication to uh, open apex, uh, large radiolucency. It's hard to get the MTA down there. Um, finally, I got it to be dense. And then we bonded this post in the middle of the root, uh, not the same indication as you would have for posts. And then we watched things heal. 
Uh, now, this current standards of the American Association of Endodontists will still say that posts are to retain buildup only. And I'm trying to get that changed because since 2002, there's been over 36 articles that all show bonding posts in this type of instance does add strength to the root. The old posts, metal posts, uh, cemented with zinc phosphate cement, yes, those were just for retaining buildup and they didn't add strength. These do, and it needs to be part of our armamentarium. But the problem is right now, the insurance company can go to my own association standards and say, hey, you, this is, you used a post you're not supposed to. We're not paying for that. Um, so we need to get that fixed. Um, also, obturating something uh, like this where there's an open apex can be difficult. There's a few different ways to go about it. This is what my cone fit looked like. Uh, I felt that that had reasonable tug and with bioceramic sealers, the whole idea of tug back is not as much of an issue. This is what it looked like after a down pack, which wasn't real dense. Um, but one of the things I like to use to try to shepherd uh, bioceramics to place and sometimes help obturate in a thin root is these micro seal condensers, the old McSpadden con compactor. It's like a reverse headstrom that goes on your slow speed and you can get this down there at 2504. This is what it looks like after just using that condenser in the gutter percha and making it more dense and getting a little bit of a sealer out the end. So we like these materials. They can be used in areas of open apex. This is a bit of resorption there. Uh, we obturate that by placing the BC putty orthograde, just like we would for root canal treatment. And we get to see things heal. And it kind of almost as it heals, it pushes it back towards the apex. So regeneration has been around now for uh, quite some time. Um, I think these original studies were right around 2000, where they had these tubercles in these teeth uh, in Japan, and they would then become necrosis, uh, necrosed. And this tooth had a sinus tract stoma. It was necrotic with chronic apical abscess. They treated it with antibiotics to harness these stem cells that we have, stem cells of the apical papilla, dental pulp stem cells, and we have stem cells of deciduous teeth. Um, and they are all over the place here. And again, this is a very hot topic in dentistry. There's actually an entire section of the Journal of the American Association of Anodontics on regenerative anodontics. And a lot of people feel this is where we will be going and that you know, by the time my daughter retires as an endodontist, um, she may be placing some sort of construct with, uh, that will in incorporate stem cells and not gutta percha or any type of uh, man-made filling material. Um, so we do get these uh, cells to pull back up inside the roots. We can stain for them, they are there. And we get this type of result where we can thicken a root. And this is the holy grail in my opinion is because when we have necrosis of an immature root, it's unlikely that tooth's going to make it uh, to the 30th birthday. So things that we do, we like to be a young patient. We don't do a lot of instrumentation. Uh, we irrigate with sodium apocrite that's dilute. We'll use either a triple antibiotic paste or calcium hydroxide. Uh, we need a blood clot to form, and then we do restoration and follow-up. So uh, we need to figure out how to not uh, damage these stem cells, usually by using sodium epichlorite and then EDTA to kind of release some of the growth factors from the dentin um, is important. Um, so I don't use a triple antibiotic paste much anymore because uh, it's really hard to get the doses just right. A uh, slurry of calcium hydroxide uh, seems to be regaining popularity and it's a little bit easier. So what we do with this is get our working length, dilute sodium hypochlorite uh, for five minutes. We dry things up. Then in, in my office right now, I'm doing calcium hydroxide. Next year, I might be back to the triple or double antibiotic paste. We restore it. Then we have them back in a couple of weeks, make sure they're doing better. <clears throat> it's real important at this visit to anesthetize them with a 3% mepivacaine, no vasoconstrictor, uh, because the hard part in this is getting the blood to come back up inside the root. So we'll irrigate just with the EDTA. We induce bleeding and in my experience, the best way to do that is to put a right angle bend on the last two millimeters of something like a 35 file, get it past the apex and spin it a little bit. So the idea is you're lacerating these tissues where the stem cells are and trying to get it to bleed back up uh, inside the pulp space, which it can do. 
Um, it's good to put a barrier over the blood clot. I like gel foam for that. Uh, call a plug will work too. And then here I'm saying white MTA. I should change this slide because white MTA will stain also. So now we're using uh, either biodentin or a root repair material. And then we put a glass ionomer over that. So as we watch these heal, they should get better real fast. <clears throat> then the periapical radiolucency should go away. And if we're going to get thickening of the dentinal walls, which I get about one case in three, um, which to me is not real good. Uh, that's going to take probably a couple of years to show. Um, so this was Olivian, and this was 2012 when we started. Tooth number nine was necrotic, and this is a disaster. Um, if we you know, had the old way of doing this, where we would do apixification, this tooth probably wouldn't last more than a couple of years with these weak dentinal walls. So I thought this would be a good indication for regeneration. This is how she looked when she left in 2012, 2013. Certainly things were healed up here, but I wasn't really seeing a whole lot of thickening of the root. 2014, maybe some thickening of the root. Now the tooth is starting to darken a little bit. 2016 in May, maybe it's thicker here, but still not as much as I would really like and a little reparative dentin here. Um, she still didn't like the color. Then she got, I think, to middle school and said, I want this lightened up. Um, and this is what she had. So it was rather dark at that time. And every single one I've done with white or gray MTA has turned out like this. Um, so we took that out. I took the MTA out, which enabled me to look at this reparative dentin. And if you look carefully, there's a little area right here where there is tissue. And when I poked that, she was numb, but not quite numb enough because when I poked that, she said, ow. And I thought, that's really cool. We regenerated something that has feeling there. Um, it wasn't just, you know, uh, blood clot in there. There was something where, where nerve elements made it all the way up in there too. And we don't really know what we're getting in that. Um, so this is what it looked like after we bleached it. Now, when we bleach it, we're bleaching it, but we're not removing the things that made it dark. So I do now tell everyone, okay, we bleach this. We might have to do this, you know, every handful of years. And, you know, if we can do better, maybe a veneer someday, uh, but it probably is going to darken over time. So this was another regeneration case they did uh, in tooth number seven. That's what it looked like. We did have periapical radiolucency. And then I placed my, uh, at this point, white MTA. And if we follow this over time, we can see that that root continues to grow and we get repair to dentin and thickening of the walls. So this is a nice regeneration case, but what I'm concerned about is we got thickening down here, but this is the area I really want it. And that's challenging to get the blood clot all the way up here and get thickening in that area. Um, so I thought this was a really cool case. Um, this was a Denzin Dente um, that presented several different challenges. Um, first of all, if you look at that, there is a, First of all, it's wide open, both parts of the dens and dente, and there's a radiolucency there, and that's coming from the most distal portion of the dens and dente. Um, and there is a vital tissue actually in the mesial portion. So this did not go very well for this young man because the infection from the necrosed area made it very difficult for me to get the vital area numb. Um, but what I wound up doing, if you look there on the other side, you can see, and then there's this enamel lined area right here, and these are normal roots. So I wound up doing regeneration for the area that was um, necrosed, and then I did a pulp cap for the area that was vital. And I tried to regenerate this area too, but that was a little foolhardy because this is actually enamel lining this and that didn't work. But I thought this was resounding success. This, I mean, we saw the radiolucency and there was swelling and abscess on this area. This, uh, there was still vital pulp and I was able to just do a direct pulp cap on that. He did come back and it was a little dark um, and he had stayed away for a long time because it didn't go well for him. And I pride myself on keeping people comfortable during treatment, but he wasn't really a big fan of mine. Um, but then he came back, we were able to get him numb this time and we were able to lighten that up for him and replace those materials. And that's how he looked after we bleached it. And now I hope we're friends. 
Um, and this is, I did single, uh, what would be akin to single visit obturation of this enamel line portion in the middle of the root. This is now the BC putty where we did the regeneration. And this is BC putty where we just did vital pulp cap and there's still a pulp space there. Um, this I think I'm going to publish and this um, was uh, Anastasia and she came to me first here in 2000, I got a video of it, uh, first in 2008, how are we doing on time? Um, and she had had some treatment done to tooth number 30 and if you look at those apices on tooth number 31, they're still forming and it's very much open there in the distal of tooth number 30. Um, she went away for five years because uh, I told her we need to do something about this. And when she came back, it was 2013. And at that time, uh, I thought, well, you know, we should take a CT of this and see what we have. So I hope everyone's doing okay. I wasn't planning on taking a break. It's really odd, again, lecturing into this abyss. Um, it started about um, six, 45, so I have about another half an hour if, if that's okay. So this is what the CT looked like. And I thought it was interesting because the nothing had happened to that distal apex on tooth number 30 in, in uh, five years, but 31 had closed up. So um, I was hopeful that we could do some sort of regeneration on that. And it's, I've never really seen a regeneration done where there was an initial treatment. Um, this video is kind of lagging a little bit. Maybe I can fast forward. So we did the regeneration treatment. This is what she looked like uh, in 2014 at one year, uh, which was healing and a little bit of closure at the apex. And this is what she looks like in, two, in 2020, where we've had thickening of this area. And I think that's rather miraculous that it sat there for five years and didn't change. But then when we did the regeneration procedure, provoked the stem cells at the tip of the root and made a blood clot here, we did get some regeneration, not all the way up and not where the old filling material was, but we went from this um, that had been stuck like that for a while to something where we regenerated some thickness. So um, I always like to show this one and usually I'm asking questions because usually there are people um, this was a 52 year old man who was in my office with a significant toothache in tooth number nine. And if we take a look, the pulp spaces are not symmetrical at all. This looks like a 52 year old. This looks like a 12 year old. And I asked him, had you ever had trauma to this tooth? Cause it really didn't seem to be anything else wrong with it. He said, nope. And, uh, so I'll never forget. I was getting him numb. And while I got in, while I was getting him numb, he became really agitated. And I was concerned that he was having like an epinephrine reaction or something. And as soon as I got the syringe out of his mouth, he said, you know, when I was 12, my brother and I were wrestling. He kneed me in the mouth and this tooth went back toward the roof of my mouth and we put it back in the right spot and we never told anybody. And I said, well, there you go. Uh, that's probably why you are here right now. And uh, he said he was going to reconnect with his brother that night. So anyway, this had happened 40 years before I saw him. And that's why I always tell people, hey, these teeth are never out of the woods. When I accessed into this tooth, there was something still in there. And I stuck my pigtail explorer in there. And this is what I pulled out. Is this odd like pulp skeleton that had been sitting there, again, not bothering anyone for 40 years because bacteria had not become involved. And then recently bacteria had gotten in there. Um, and that had sat there for that amount of time. And when I take a look at it, something had gone on because this is like collagen. This had been actively secreted. It wasn't that it just died. Um, it had been under repair and then died. So it was a dynamic process to have this look like, uh, this tissue look like this when we did histology on it with a little, uh, little bacteria at the apex. So root fractures are kind of an interesting thing to manage. A lot of them don't require treatment. Let me say that again. A lot of them don't require treatment. Uh, and we tend to get a little worked up about things sometimes and maybe we should just leave them alone sometimes. Uh, we wanna treat that coronal segment only and we don't do a lot of splinting. So this is a patient that came to us to treat tooth number eight. 
Uh, it was responding normally to pulp testing. Uh, we actually took the splints on and off a few times and just followed it. At six months, things are kind of starting to round a little bit in this area. At nine months, again, asymptomatic, uh, things looking a little bit more calcified. This is what he looked like at a year, and this is what he looked like at 18 months. And we get this type of healing a lot where bone will come in between these. We've got pulp canal obliteration happening, which in my opinion is favorable. And this tooth is not very mobile. And remember short roots is not a disease. And actually mobile teeth is also not a disease as long as they're not causing discomfort for the patient. Um, another case where we didn't do a whole lot, I didn't even really know that tooth number nine was fractured the first time he came to me as we started following, this is what these teeth look like. And at two years, again, no treatment, no increased mobility, and they were healing. They don't always heal. And this was Ronnie, he was 20 and took an elbow in the mouth playing basketball. Um, so this was a root fracture that required treatment. Uh, we were also doing root canal treatment on tooth number nine. And you can tell this wasn't his first time having some sort of injury. So uh, we treated tooth number nine normally. Tooth number eight, we obturated with bioceramic just to the coronal portion of the segment. This is not going to pose, pose a problem very often if we just leave it alone. If we try to treat down in there though, uh, often that will become a problem. And we used a different splint for him too. So um, this uh, was done, uh, I didn't do this case initially, but got the x-rays. Um, apparently the apex locator was going off somewhere around here. Um, so they were a little suspicious. There might be a root fracture. So when they obturated this, they obturated a lot of it with MTA and then a little bit of it spilled out into this area, but they had treated the apical segment too. Um, turns out this actually became symptomatic and this is what it looked like at six months and it was very tender to percussion. So we did a surgery on that and this is what it looked like six months after the surgery. Now remember, Auntie's Law from your Schillingberg textbook, what gives teeth support is the surface area of root in bone, right? So if you've got a large circumference at the coronal portion of a tooth and you lose a little bit of bone apically from the coronal segment, you're losing a lot of surface area. If you've got a real thin diameter at the apex and we lose six or seven millimeters of the apex of a tooth, we're not losing much surface area in the bone. We can get away with murder taking away the tip of a root and still have nice stability of the root, where if we had the same thing happening in periodontal disease heading uh, south down the tooth, that'd be a disaster. Um, and if, as the endodontist, this drives me crazy. This was now a year and a half down the road and he still hadn't gotten this restored. I probably should have done it myself. Um, more and more endodontists are doing that. So root fractures, if it's an apical third, it's pretty easy to take care of. Medical, middle third, fair. If it's coronal third, it's pretty tough. Um, so we get asked sometimes about orthodontic treatment of teeth uh, with root fractures. There are some case reports where the fractured segment moves with the crown. That seems a little unlikely to me. Um, it seems dependent on what type of movement you're planning on doing. Usually they're going to recommend a waiting period before they do something. Um, this was published in um, Contemporary Clinical um, Dentistry in 2013. And how this wound up being published, I honestly don't know, um, because it really kind of goes through everything that I just said you shouldn't do. Um, they went ahead and treated both segments. Um, they then bonded a composite post in there. As you can see, the periapical radiolucency is developing as they do this. Um, and this was so that it can move it orthodontically. If they had just treated to here with a bioceramic, they probably wouldn't have had any of this issue. And who cares about maintaining this? It's not really adding any support at this point. And in their post-op, this was what they showed. Magically, this tooth um, got shifted over to the other side um, and no one caught it in the publication. Maybe not quite as badly uh, resorbed here, but you know, to me, this is an example of what not to do. Um, here's another case where they uh, looked at orthodontic movement and it worked out uh, when they moved this tooth that had root fractures. But if you look, it doesn't seem like they were moving it very much um, to get the result, but it had healed while they were doing that. Um, this was a patient that presented to my office. Um, and I remember this was early on in my career. 
And back when I used to take lunch and I said, yeah, just put her, put her at lunch. That'll be real easy. <clears throat> and I started accessing this tooth number seven and I should have been aware um, of what was going on. Um, but I thought, well, let's get her out of pain, not a big deal. So I had uh, at that point you know, a nice 9A clamp on it and with you know the dam was really tight on the dam frame. And after I accessed it, this happened. The crown got launched across the operatory and landed on my pergo floor. And it seemed like it rattled around on my floor for five minutes before it stopped. And of course the rubber dam is now on her chest. And I look and there's nothing left of the tooth. And I looked at the x-ray. We always do that when something goes wrong, right? And then I saw, gee, this looks different. And then I asked her, you know, have you ever had trauma to this tooth? And I'm sure she was thinking, well, you know, not until today. Um, but if you look back on it, you can see that she doesn't have periodontal disease, yet there was some bone loss here. And you can see this kind of necking in of the pulp space right where this horizontal fracture was. Um, so now I've got this, uh, again, 35 year old woman in my chair with no front tooth. I don't have stuff for temporaries, but I figured we could go ahead and get her necrotic pulp out of there. Um, and now I've got this crown sitting here again, shade matches pretty good. So I picked up a post and I re-cemented it and that's how she left that day. Uh, she came back and we used the same bit of crown to bond to the teeth on either side and then put a little button in the lingual and extruded this tooth in order to get crown margins. And that's how she left. This is not a different angle. This is flush up here. Another root fracture, again, treat the coronal part of it. This seems rather hopeless, right? But this is what uh, we did. This is now three-year recall, asymptomatic. It's not mobile. So I, I do call this a root fracture. Luxation injuries when teeth are moved. Um, can be a little more complicated. Um, they come in a few different varieties. Concussion is just when it's bumped and it's sore, we can adjust the occlusion and follow that. Subluxation is when it's loose, but not moved. Sometimes we'll splint those uh, for a couple of weeks. Again, good follow-up for those. Usually we don't have an issue. This is what concussion, I love these cartoons. This is from that Andresen textbook that I showed you. Um, and I love these cartoons because they talk about three different areas and really it's important to keep these in mind when we have a, a, a luxation injury. The apex, middle of the root, and then the sulcus. So not much going on at the apex or in the middle of the root, maybe a little bleeding of the sulcus like I showed you in the, some of those pictures early on. Subluxation, maybe a little more involved each area, possibly some interdiction of the blood supply at the apex and then some bleeding in the sulcus. So when we have a major displacement, to me, that's over five millimeters in an adult tooth. They can be lateral and extrusive. We wanna reposition them and splint them for a couple of weeks. No real long splint times anymore. If you got those handouts um, that I had them sent out, take a look at all them, print them out and have them those tables taped up in your office somewhere. It's okay to have cheat sheets in life. Everything I'm talking about tonight is on those guidelines and they were just updated. So um, please, if you didn't get the handouts, download them and use them. They're, they're gonna be way more useful to you than me. Um, and, and I love the way the International, Dental Associ or International Association of Dental Traumatology um, makes those tables that uh, summarize things real well. So um, wanna follow up these teeth, same thing. Fair prognosis now, if you've had a luxation injury because in order for the tooth to move, something has to give. A lot of times there'll be this fracture of the alveolus, which will come back as we uh, reposition the tooth. We're gonna have, again, if it's an adult tooth, total interdiction of the blood supply, this tearing injury of the sulcus, and more important, this crushing injury of the sulcus here. Tearing, we're pulling things apart, but the cells to, to facilitate healing are still there. We put them back together, we can get healing where they're crushing, there's no blood supply, cells are dying. And in that area, we're not going to get healing and that's important on down the road. So uh, this young man was playing football, smashed his face. He was one of the toughest patients I had ever had. Um, if you look, there really isn't a whole lot of room there to reposition tooth number nine. I got him numb, I put the forceps on it. I kind of moved the distal to where it should be. And then I rotated the mesial and it kind of popped through the contact and got to place. I think he was about 10, didn't even flinch. Um, got it back where we need to be. 
splinted that, sutured the papilla in the middle. And I like um, a couple different things to splint with. Uh, this ribbon bondable reinforcement fabric um, is a nice thing to do because we can adjust how rigid it is based on how much composite we put over the fabric. Um, so this is a fairly loose splint. If I wanted it to be more rigid, I would put more composite here. And it's real important that we suture these areas so that we don't have exposed bone when there's been an injury. Um, so that's how we left. We did the root canal, came back, took the splint off. Um, so again, with alveolar fractures and luxation injuries, we're almost always going to see something going wrong with the socket. And we need to think about repositioning that too when we reposition the tooth. Um, so this was not exactly a hygiene ace here. Um, he wasn't keeping this real clean, but these teeth had been luxated. And this is the ribbon splint that I thought was reasonable choice, uh, but this had allowed this tooth to actually super erupt. So I like the titanium trauma splint in these cases, which is this metal mesh. Um, and again, we bond this to the teeth. And the idea is this is flexible, buccolingually and rigid occlusal apically or incisal apically. Um, so it's always nice to bond that on the teeth on either side um, and then bond the tooth that you want to position last. So now I put a little apical pressure on tooth number nine and then bond just a flowable composite to that. And that I think is at one week. And I think that is at three weeks. And then we take the splint off. Um, and then sometimes the last ones to find out, brownie points will cut composite and they will polish enamel and porcelain. So if we just run that over there, it takes away that uh, composite. I think that looks pretty good compared to the way you came in. Um, so this was another luxation injury, and this is Lauren, and Lauren was 16, and she was playing softball, and it was a sunny day. There was a pop fly. She lost it in the sun. She thought that was funny. It landed on her face and pushed 24 and 25 lingually. She had just gotten her braces off, and like I said, she was 16, and when she got to my office, she was hysterical. She thought, oh my god, two more years of braces. I've got prom pictures coming up um, and, and she was really upset about the whole thing. When I took a couple of radiographs, uh, they looked like they had been displaced, but I thought, you know what? It's not that far, it's under five millimeters. We got a shot. We're just gonna put these back in place and splint them and see. So we reposition them. This is a fishing line and composite. If you're a fisherman, this is Andy Clear Tournament 20 pound test, uh, which can be used for splints also. Um, the problem is now we've got a pulp that I'm worried about how it's going to do. So when we send her away, uh, we have a chance of a necrotic pulp now creating antigens. And the problem is the surface of a root no longer has cementum if it's been damaged and the antigens from the pulp can march out that area. And then the same thing that happens at an apex will happen to the root and we get this type of resorption. And this was just one month and this was a disaster. Uh, so now it's time to initiate root canal therapy and put calcium hydroxide in there long-term so that we can take care of the effects of the macrophage specifically when it has interleukin-1 influencing it um, and try to take care of the root resorption. I'm gonna go fast through this cause we're getting a little little slow on time. I can give you two hours on resorption if you want, uh, but really uh, we have a couple things that are related to trauma, infection related apical resorption um, or traumatic infection related resorption. And also we're gonna talk about ankylosis a little bit. So with this, we've got damaged cementum and we have bacteria from the pulp making it out and causing resorption of the root. So we do long-term calcium hydroxide or triple antibiotic paste. Once we see some sort of PDL <clears throat> reestablishing there, and then we can go ahead and obturate the canal. She was on then a very short lease for tooth number 24. And we took care of that, no resorption on 24 and followed her over time. And that's what she looked like at four months. And this is six years. And it was kind of cute because at this point um, she wanted to be a dentist. And I thought that was pretty neat because of her experience here. Um, and this is where the cementum was probably damaged. You can finally now see a little tear in the cementum and this is filled back in with bone, which is all we're going to get. We're not gonna get new root. 
Um, so yeah, she wanted to be a dentist um, and then she took the DAT and then she decided she didn't want to be a dentist anymore. Um, so, you know, it, it's not for everybody, right? You guys are dentists, give yourself credit. Not everyone makes it. So we also have extrusive luxation, same thing. We want to reposition those. Um, this was a horse kick and this woman actually was lucky to survive. Um, I just want to really quickly show you one thing on this because they put the pins into the roots. We did root canal treatment on a couple of these teeth and did root canal just on the coronal segment of this because I didn't want to go past that. This went to the oral surgeon to just do an apicoectomy here because I had already teed it up with MTA and we just have a composite. So all you got to do is just get this root tip out of here. That's how she came back. Root tip's still there and we have an implant. Oh, well, people look at it differently. Um, she had some of this resorption that we were trying to combat. Um, and we'll see this type of internal resorption that mimics another topic that we'll talk about another night, cervical resorption. And it's actually kind of a replacement resorption inside the tooth that we'll see after trauma. This is more garden variety external resorption uh, on this tooth. And we tried like heck to get these to behave. Calcium hydroxide, root canal treatment, and we could not get uh, 24 and 25 um, to come, or 23 and 24 to calm down. She wound up actually having both those extracted and one implant placed. Um, this seems like a reasonable way to go about it. One implant with two heads on it um, into this area. And I guess that was where the best bone was. Um, she did wind up having multiple root canals at other places. So extrusive luxation, the tooth has moved out of the socket a bit. Same thing as far as the blood supply and the tearing of the PDL cells. Um, this is Josh who fell off his bike uh, late one night at Chico State. And if you went to Chico State, you know how that could happen. And we repositioned that tooth. Nothing too unusual about that other than the um, resorption at the apex. So um, if it's intruded, those are bad injuries. And open apex, sometimes they'll just come back out if it's less than seven millimeters. If it's severe over seven millimeters, we need to grab those with forceps and get them back. Um, if it's a closed apex, we got to reposition surgically or orthodontic uh, if it's more than three to seven millimeters and we need to stabilize that. If it's more than seven millimeters, we got to grab it with the forceps and follow those. So intrusion is a bad injury because we have all of this crushing uh, injury on the PDL. Uh, so pulps just do not survive intrusion if it's, an, if it's a mature tooth. So this was Michael and he had intruded these teeth in Hawaii um, and they had tried to splint them together, uh, but that hadn't gone real well. So we retrieved these with the forceps. And I have to say, once I got that up out of the socket it was locked into, it was very loose. There really wasn't much holding it in there. Uh, but we got them cleaned up and then we did the titanium trauma splint after we had sutured this area um, closed. And then the titanium trauma splint went over all of that. It actually, again, wound up healing really well. I wish he was a little bit better at brushing his teeth. Um, I then took the splint off of the one tooth I was most worried about and checked for mobility because if it was still real mobile, I was going to then just bond right back to that tooth. Turns out it wasn't and we were able to take the splint all the way off. And this is how he left back to the restorative dentist. We had done a few root canals, but that looks a lot better than when he came in. And I hope he starts brushing his teeth better. Sometimes we get lucky. And in this case, we had an intrusion uh, of an, a, an elderly woman who fell down and hit the mantle and it kind of skidded out of the socket here. So I was hopeful that in her case, we wouldn't have the same issue with the crushing injury and we kind of caught a break. So um, this is Katie and she had intruded this tooth. We bonded a button on that and brought it up. And I was really concerned when I saw this because this is replacement resorption from the crushing injury that we see. And I told mom at this time, you know, this is going to get worse and we're gonna lose this tooth someday soon. Um, this was 2005, it was getting worse. Um, December 2005, it didn't seem much worse. And in 2008, it almost looked like it had healed a little bit. And this tooth was actually 
had physiologic mobility at that time and they lost her to follow up. But this was encouraging and we never really know. And I think sometimes when we jump the gun on getting teeth like this out, we do a disservice. So this was a rather significant trauma and these teeth were intruded. And then there was orthodontic movement. And one question that we get since these kids are in the age where they would be having ortho is what do we do for ortho movement after a traumatic dental injury? Usually they wanna wait a couple months to a couple of years. And it's important that these teeth, again, it's important to move them. They need to go where they need to go, but they are more likely to have resorption or pulpal pathology even after a longer waiting period. But it makes sense to take a little waiting period before they're moved. And we just need to do more diligent monitoring on these teeth. So I'm actually gonna skip primary teeth since we're getting a little low on time. And we'll get to evulsions. So fortunately, avulsions aren't real common. They're rather dramatic. We need to get them back in quickly. And 30 minutes seems to be a key when you read the literature. The literature is mostly Scandinavian. And in my opinion, um, Scandinavians do really well on these teeth that are knocked out for that long because they're knocked out into the snow and they can then put them back. In California, it seems like if it's out more than five minutes, it's not going to do real well. Um, but the studies will say up to 30 minutes, uh, you can have 90% success. To me, five minutes is more important. We can put them back after a while, but ankylosis will most likely result. So what happens at the scene of the accident is actually way more important than a dentist could ever do. Someone there needs to get control and get that tooth back in the socket. If they can't, they can do Hank's Bout salt solution or milk or even the vestibule. One mom actually put her child's tooth in her vestibule and that's the way they went to the dentist. So we don't want it to dry out, wrap it in plastic. If you can't do anything, replant it. Save a teeth has gone through a few different owners. I think now this is still where you can get it. Um, and in my opinion, you know, every athletic trainer, every ambulance driver should have one of those. So when they get to the office and it's a closed apex, we don't want to scrub things down. We don't want to sterilize the tooth. You don't do the root canal on your hands. You get it back in quickly. If it's been out over an hour, you can soak it in the fluoride. All this is in the handout. By the way, I'm gonna go through this kind of quick because my, my estimate, I have five more minutes. Uh, so we wanna reposition, reposition the fractures and uh, the alveolar socket. Um, irrigate the socket with saline and replant the tooth and take a radiograph. Real important to suture those gingival lacerations and apply a flexible splint. A lot of times antibiotic therapy will be instituted doxycycline if they're over 12 and make sure they've got their tetanus. Eventually we're going to start the root canal and a lot of times over a couple of visits, um, usually up to about a month with the calcium hydroxide. And you need to tell them this is a fair to poor prognosis and they might wind up losing the tooth. This tooth was lost, and I think it's because this area was not sutured properly initially, and this bone became necrotic. That's the chunk I took out when I finally saw him, and we just could not get that to heal, and he wound up losing tooth number eight. So if it's an open apex and the extra oral time is less than 60 minutes, um, we can place the tooth in a little doxycycline, although the new regulations are calling that into question. Um, and then put it back in. This was replanted at the scene, tooth number eight by mom. And we just followed this over time. And this is miraculous healing. This is what uh, the CT looked like. She did a great job of getting it where it needed to be. We just splinted it. This is three months where it's starting to fill in. This is now seven months. And this root is continuing to grow. We're getting thickening of the root here. This is a home run. This is way better than any dental treatment ever could have been. And that's just by replanting it, it revascularizes, all the cells are still there and it continues on at an accelerated rate. And that's 13 months. Um, this may be starting to look a little fishy up here, but there isn't anything to do about it at this point. Sometimes if we replant these teeth, we will get this internal PDL. And I consider this also a favorable result where we have bone growing into there. So if it's more than an hour, that's the time where you can do the extra oral uh, root canal. Uh, we know it's going to be resorbed. So we just fill the root space with this Vitapex calcium hydroxide 
and replant it, it's going to be resorbed. Um, so this was Tristan and he got to my office. He was doing bench press and apparently his hand slipped off the bar and his spotter was not paying attention. Something more interesting than Tristan was walking by the waiting room at that time. And the bar hit him in the face and knocked tooth number nine out. He says he replanted it right away. Um, so we splinted that, we did root canal treatment on it. And this is what he looked like at a year. We were already starting to lose a little bit. He wound up needing root canal and tooth number eight also. This is what nine looked like at three years. And this is what replacement resorption looks like. And there really isn't a whole lot to do for that once it gets started. And this is again, PDL and cementum dying. Sometimes if it's small, it can heal. Um, but if you get this started and it involves a significant amount of the root, it is just going to eventually be replaced by bone. And it's not because of the necrotic pulp. You often wind up doing root canals because of the injury, but the pulp has nothing to do with it, unfortunately. Um, it will actually have this ringing upon percussion that we see. This is what the histology looks like. It's bone straight to root. And over time, just the only thing that's left is this little moat of um, got to purchase. This was actually today. And this guy has resorption, external root resorption. But if you listen to the percussion, it's different on the teeth with resorption. Hear that? Dead, higher ringing, higher, dead, higher ringing. And then 15, normal, 14, ringing. I like percussion as a screening for cervical root resorption. If I see one area of cervical root resorption, I'm gonna percuss every tooth in the mouth and see if we can find one that rings and then I'm gonna take a CT of that. This is all he had on tooth number three and it gave us that distinctly different ringing on percussion. Um, so when we have these teeth where it has uh, undergone uh, external ankylosis replacement resorption when they're developing, it's a mess. And we'll get this discrepancy as far as how the alveolus is developing. So we don't have a lot of options for that. We can extract, we can do orthodontics, we can do submergence with uh, which endodontists like, or we can do auto transplantation. The submergence is where we just take all the root filling out of the root. We leave the root there and cut off the coronal portion and allow the root to act like a uh, large particle graft over time. And when we do this, we can actually get bone to grow up over what is left of the root. And we don't get that with particle graft. This is normal bone that comes up over the root if we have the CEJ on either side. So um, this case was given to me by Dr. Tsukuboshi uh, from Japan. Um, and Tsukuboshi is a magician at these auto transplantations. So real quick, I'll go through what he had. Tooth number eight had been evolved for a long time and tooth number nine had subluxation when he first saw this patient. So he repositioned tooth number eight and did the root canal on tooth number nine. But three years later, we have this problem with ankylosis of tooth number eight and all this asymmetry. So what Dr. Tsukuboshi does in a case like this is he looks for another tooth to put in this area. So this patient was rather crowded and they were going to extract bicuspids. So they took tooth number 20 which Dr. Sugaboshi likes because it's a very similar diameter, similar length to that central incisor and auto transplanted that to tooth number nine. Um, when they do that, if it's a young enough tooth, you don't have to do the root canal. This is what it looks like right after he does it where he submerges it um, and then allows the attachment apparatus to kind of lasso on there and then brings the tooth up as he does that, the attachment apparatus comes with it. And this is 10 months now, and it's just direct composite. This is two years. And if you look, this has a cortical plate over it. And it was already starting to come in here um, at 10 months. And there's no membrane, no graft, no, uh, no, no growth factors or anything. This is just using the attachment apparatus and bone and gingiva doing what it knows how to do if we give it um, the, right, uh, the right environment. Um, so I think I'm right at time. Um, I respect your time and you, know, you guys can 
finished dinner or whatever. Um, this is one more case here that I want to show that kind of brings it all together because this is Nikki and Nikki had fallen out of her bed when she was eight and smashed these teeth. Um, there were root fractures on these teeth. When the general dentist was going to splint these teeth, the air water syringe, when he blew air on it, tooth number eight came out of the mouth and was on the floor of his operatorium and was repositioned. So I was either the fourth or fifth endodontist in on this and she'd gotten all kinds of different uh, pieces of advice like doing surgeries and all this amazing stuff that I'm surprised people told her. Um, so I took a look, they were asymptomatic and I wanted to do you know, my favorite thing, uh, which is nothing. Um, so at one month, it didn't look so bad. It looked like maybe we were getting some healing and you know, I hope that these apices were open and maybe we would still get some blood supply here. Even though this was avulsed, if we could get some towing in of blood supply, maybe we don't need to do anything. At two months, we were starting to lose it. We're starting to get some resorption of this tooth. And this is inflammatory root resorption. Now we have to do something. Um, so we did calcium hydroxide, not real long-term for her, but we did want to disinfect the roots to stop the resorption. And <clears throat> then uh, it was time to obturate these. So I did place some calcium sulfate barrier at the tip of the root, did not address the apical segments at all. Remember I said, we don't have to address those, but now we're obturating an open apex. So I did the calcium sulfate barrier. Then we did bioceramics in back of that. And then we did um, Fuji 9 in back of that. So now we can etch, rinse and bond uh, composites into the roots to try to reinforce them. And then that's how she left. Again, in all of this, you know, this is endodontics and there is no gutta percha anywhere in this. It's just not, uh, not what we use in a case like that. So now we wanna follow her over time. And remember I said she was eight. Um, this was three years and I thought we were doing okay. That's what her gingiva looked like. Uh, at three years, I had bought my CT machine and I was really happy that we had a cortical plate. This is now 10 year recall. And now she is 18. She is this beautiful, mature, confident young lady. And now it is time to get tooth number eight out and place an implant. But now we have a developed alveolus. And this is a completely different situation than if we had pulled the teeth. And while this may be the sequence that we had on the cover of that tooth or that traumatic injury atlas, I really think that you know this is this kind of incorporates all the biology that I think is important about managing trauma, and also you know she had teeth growing up. She didn't look at herself in the mirror before she put her flipper in and and see no teeth. She didn't worry about eating lunch with her friends in middle school and having her teeth come out, and she she grew up a different person I say because she had front teeth. And it was because we did things like this and dentists do this for people every day. We need to give ourselves credit for it because it's a heck of a service. Um, so uh, I wanna real quickly go over with you one thing that I think is important. I know it's past time, but this guy, Tim Urban does some stuff on procrastination and he has this thing that he calls a life calendar that he shows in one of his talks. And the idea here is each one of these squares is a week in a 90 year life. And if you look at that closely, lean into your computer, there aren't that many squares there. You can see each one and we need to make them count. I turned 58 this week. This is 2020 for me. This is just one half of one line. It's significant, you can see it. And you know what, 2020 is over. This is a week that I lectured to the San Mateo Dental Society. It's only covering one square, but you can see it. It's a mark. It's only one week out of 90 years, but it is significant. When we go to dental school, this is what dental school occupies of our life. This is what our career is. There is so much more opportunity to grow and evolve and learn in our career than there ever was in dental school. So it's important that education is what survives after these facts that we learn turn out to not be true and we then need to move on. So we don't wanna be this old rat still rest, uh, lever pressing for food when it's not giving us a reward anymore. It's important to evolve and to, to keep an open mind to things. So thank you for your attention.
But I think this sums up dentistry for me. You know, you guys just spent a lot of time listening to me. I hope there was some new information. And it's great to sit here and have all these interesting theories, but dentistry turns out to be hard work. And it's hard work that we need to be disciplined on every day for our patients. And I love the saying, before enlightenment, I chopped wood and carried water. After enlightenment, I chopped wood and carried water. It's hard work and we need to do it every day. So this is me. Thank you for your attention. I guess you guys are still out there. <laughs> We're all out there. Gosh, what a great presentation. I really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Tittle, for a great presentation. Sorry you had to talk to us all on the Zoom, uh, Zoom affair and not really in person. I hope somewhere down the road, the dental side can invite you back in a live one. I really do. They were great. Uh, I'll thank Bruce later on. It was a great, great, uh, great job. So I want to thank also all of you for joining us uh, for this evening. I know it's hard when we take time away from our families, but I'll tell you, if anybody's gone through uh, trauma coming to our office, like I have, it was pretty interesting. Uh, this will be really valuable at that time. So I just want to, I hope you found it really, the presentation really helpful. Uh, the other good news is this meeting has been recorded. Uh, Dr. Chittle allowed us to. Uh, it will be emailed to you and it'll be posted to our uh, Simtoe County Dental Society Facebook page. Uh, stay safe out there. A healthy New Year's, I'm telling my patients. And please enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night now. <laughs>